10 minutes on uh, something that can improve everybody's welds. Um, just a very simple concept. Um, when, you, uh, when you're looking at a weld, when, when you see a beautiful weld, when you see a beautiful weld, you know, it looks something like, like this. All right, it's a little sloppy. All right, that looks pretty good, right? That would be a pretty decent weld. All right, what makes this a beautiful weld is keeping everything inside the lines. Now, it's easy to point out the flaws in this weld when you see somebody going out of the lines, right? That's immediately when you notice that the weld is starting to misbehave, right? Not look too good. All right, so one of the basic, most uh, basic secrets <coughs> is keeping it parallel. So I'm kind of glad they got these little dots on there. So any position of the weld, if you can keep two parallel lines. So you can imagine that if you're MIG welding, TIG welding, stick welding, any kind of welding, brazing, okay, you're basically going to have the same weld puddle, right? You have, you're always going to have a weld puddle, and you're going to have a direction that you're going, and you're going to have, you know, you're going to have your, your bead going, right? And uh, sometimes, sometimes it's not, I always think half circle away, start the next puddle. But so you know when you're when you're welding sometimes you don't you don't do anything at all but just hold that stick in the groove. Alright? Um, or the MIG welder you're holding it in there. I was explaining the other day sometimes some situations you got old crappy equipment, right? And you got little potholes and you got little <coughs> dingleberries and you got garbage all along your path. Now yeah, of course, uh, you want to clean it up, make it as nice as possible, but in certain, most situations, time is of the essence. So when you're, when you're coming along, you, get, you hit a pothole or a little groove or some, some place that needs a little more fill, the simple rule is, okay, just hold your puddle there until it fills out to the sides, right? That's it, okay? When you hit it, encounter a little bump with some extra material there, okay, you're going to go a little faster. You're going to fill in the next one a little bit. You're going to move ahead faster, and still all your concentration is on these outside two points, okay? Because once you get out of the line, look how ugly that looks right away. See how you can see the ugly just happening as I draw it. That's what your weld is doing. It's, I mean, we're all trying to make like a very nice weld, okay? And this is the million dollar secret right here, is making a weld that stays between the lines, okay? Simple, simple, simple. All right, so uh, as you progress, if you are focusing on these two parallel lines, that will control your speed. It will also control your temperature. Now, uh, I just remember the last, what I, what I wanted to ask. Now, who can tell me how to control, let's imagine that you're stick welding, okay? Just so we're not confused. Let's say you're stick welding. Who can tell me one or two or three ways to make the weld hotter without adjusting your machine? Anybody? Who can think of one way to make it hotter? You can just stick the same place for longer. Go slower, right? If you go slower, it gets hotter. If you go, so if you go faster, what happens? gets colder, right? All right, so there are many, actually many ways of controlling temperature while you're stick welding, okay? Name another way of bring, making the weld hotter. Anybody? Your arc gap. Arc gap, very, very good. I was just thinking of that myself. The distance between your, your work and your, let's say this is your welding rod magnified, okay? and your little droplets are coming out of here and the farther your distance between your actual puddle and the rod that makes your weld <coughs> hotter. Now how do you make it colder then? Closer. Closer. Alright, jam that sucker right down in there. 
that makes it colder. All right. All of this is affected uh, in the same way. Basically, you're moving along and you want it. You want it hotter. All right. You want it hotter so you can make this a perfect parallel line, right? Now, uh, here's who can, can anyone think of it? There's, there's at least five other ways to control temperature. Can anyone, how about dragging versus pulling? Which pushing or dragging, all right, this would be dragging the weld, all right, and this would be pushing the weld. All right, which one is, I'm, I gotta think of this for myself, which one is hotter, pushing or pulling? Dragging or pushing? <laughs> huh? Uh, Tom, what's hotter, dragging or pushing? <laughs> I'm not putting anybody on the spot. I'm just trying to... Huh? I think pushing, pushing in the vertical up is definitely hotter. Um, no, it's colder. Yeah, yeah, I think pushing is colder on vertical up uh, because if you're trying to drag it vertical up, it's pretty damn hot. Push it in. Yeah, if you put, yeah, that's the gap distance. Uh, I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> One of them's hotter. Uh, uh, and it comes naturally. When you weld a lot, it's just like you don't even think about it. You're just, you're either dragging or you're pushing. Okay. Um, for MIG welders, stopping and starting is uh, maybe not that ethical. I mean, uh, uh, but if you're working on a junkyard piece of crap, it doesn't matter if you stop and start. All right, we had uh, we had a situation welding this year uh, with we we were kind of forced to weld with some very large wire on wire feed 564s, and some of our guys were trying to control the temperature by stopping and starting, and basically that was not permitted on a very um, high high quality type job. So uh, I want you to uh, look for other ways that you can control temperature without having to change your machine. There are other ways, okay. Obviously thicker metal is colder than thin metal. Uh, uh, can anyone think of any other ways? There's, there's, um, there's more ways than you can imagine to uh, control temperature. I can't believe I should have wrote them all down, but uh, <laughs> all right, so, all right, one more thing about parallel lines while we're thinking about it. Uh, a parallel, parallel lines on pipe or uh, on, on, let's just say rounded structures. All right, you still are dealing with parallel lines. Now, the, the more parallel you make this, the more accurate you make this arc, you can see where the ugliness comes in. The more perfect you can make it, the better off you are. All right, so I want you to remember this when you're TIG welding, when you're MIG welding. If you can stay within the lines and keep your perfect parallel lines in action all the time, you're going to be thought of <coughs> as an expert. Now, everybody wants to roll up on a job, impress someone right away. This would be the easiest and the fastest way to impress somebody with your welding. Now, I realize that, okay, you've got to have your machine set right in order to weld these perfect lines, okay? That's true. That's why I want you to practice making your welds hotter and making your welds colder without adjusting the machine because when you hit these bumpy roads, these bumps in the roads, these distractions, okay, everyone's going to face, let's say, let's say you have a big stiff beam under here it's going to absorb some of the heat. So you're always going to be dealing with changes in temperature on your welds, okay? And it should come second nature, so you don't even care what the reason is that your weld is getting hotter or colder. You're just going to adjust your pace, and you're going to define it all by these two parallel lines. So when you, if you've got to sit there and hover until that thing, I don't care if you're there for a minute. If it takes that long to get a perfect puddle filled up, I don't care if you're there for a half a second, okay? You're going to be there long enough to fill your puddle and move on, okay? Simple sort of logic, but now I hope that everyone, while you're looking at your welds and your other people's welds, uh, you will now be able to visualize 
what it is I can do to improve the shape and appearance of my weld, okay? When you're, uh, this, one of the secrets to vertical up is more temperature control, right? And temperature control during the weld. Now you don't, you can't just turn the machine. Now maybe some high tech machines do alternate and pulse in a way that you could do it, but I, I let's just stick old school here. Uh, when I do a, when I do a vertical up, I concentrate my heat left, right, left, right, and I never waste any time in the middle, okay? So boom, 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 and now, now you see, if I, if I don't keep my parallel lines, if I'm stopping at all kinds of random spots here, my weld's gonna look like crap, and it will, trust me, but if you can, if you can, uh, anybody got a welding, have one of these welding rods right here? This one right here, the eighth inch has got a bigger the better, I need a big one. All right, if you notice the sides of your weld, welding rod, Use that as a guide, okay? So if you want to know where your parallel line should stop and start, uh, all right, go ahead and use your welding rod as the guide. So when this edge of the rod hits your parallel line, boom, you're done. Boom, you're done. Boom, you're done, okay? You don't need to go over, right? You just go to the same, the edge of your rod, that's, that's gonna be where your weld finishes. I've noticed that the edge of your rod is where your puddle stops, okay? Roughly. I mean, you might as well just measure it that way. All right, so when you're coming this way, now there's other ways to measure, to see your, your stops and your starts. Now, now weave, weaving is dangerous because we can't really be, we can't be, why? What's the rule on weaves, Tom? For a weave, uh, when we're doing a weave, it's, what is it, three times the thickness of the rod, like eighth inch times three is the maximum weave? Three eighths is the maximum size of the weld. Three eighths? Basically three times the size of the actual filler rod, that's the, that's the biggest you can weave. Now stringers, the reason stringer welds, stringer welds, let's say you have to fill up an area you have to have a certain size weld. The way you measure a weld size, let's say you have to do quarter inch weld. Well, you don't look here at the face, or let's see you got a little bit of convex here. You got quarter inch weld is here to here and here to here. It has to be symmetrical, right? Quarter inch by quarter inch gives you a much, who knows their uh, 90 degree triangles? That, that face here is going to be bigger than quarter inch. <coughs> what, are, uh, what is it? Uh, two times two times it three? Or? Yeah, what the hell is uh, quarter? What is that? <laughs> a, a squared, A squared, B squared, A, B, C. All right, anybody got their math? <laughs> All right, so that's, the, uh, that's how you figure out a quarter inch square times quarter inch square equals that. All right. <laughs> Listen, please. And a lot of people think bigger is always better, and it's not necessarily welding. Uh, I've seen a lot of welders over the years think, I'm going to make the fillet weld. If it calls for a quarter inch fillet weld, I'm going to make it a half inch. You just doubled the size of your fillet weld. But the math that's involved with the, with the amount of metal that you put in there, now you're going to use four times more filler rod to make that weld twice the size. So. Engineers love to do that, by the way. Uh, oh, that won't be enough. Let's uh, let's make it <laughs> half an inch or something. So that costs people like the call four times the amount of money to make that weld. Now just cost you double the size of that fillet. Yeah, so. that's that's very true. And so what I was going to say about stringers, you can back me up here, Rich, on this. If you have so if you have a certain size weld. And you don't want to you don't want to do it all in one weave because it's bigger than three times the weld. Then you're going to do stringers. So in other words, you're going to take and build your passes in stringer fashion instead of a weave. And the reason is because that that temperature is much cooler with three stringer passes. And we'll talk more later about heat affected zone, which is that which is that fuzzy area next to the welds that changes color is affected by the heat. Okay, so the less heat affected, or the, le the stringer passes gives you a better heat affected zone, 
and less shrinkage and metal stress. All right, every weld shrinks and pulls, and uh, and so it does affect every every project. I mean, imagine building a bridge. If you're not concerned with the metal shrinkage and heat affected zone, you could have some serious measurements. You know, out of you know, basically that whole structure is going to contort and twist and stretch and pull in all sorts of directions. So to build a project with multiple welds straight and square and perfect takes a lot of knowledge of how these welds shrink and pull. So, all right, I appreciate everyone's attention. We got a lot more to learn this year. It's going to be fantastic. I can't wait to hear what Tom and uh, Rich have to say in later weeks. And we're going to have lots more experts here.